Welcome back to the Real Estate and More Show. I'm your host, Michael Hatfield. As our next guest, I have to tell you, we have an incredibly intelligent, accomplished professional on the show today. She's been 25 years, a high level experience in the fields of accounting and taxation, an amazing lady. She's worked with Fortune 500 companies with mergers, acquisitions, and complex taxation issues. Thankfully, too, she provides tax services to medium and little bitty businesses like my own in our community. In fact, if you were Spider-Man, you would hire this amazing CPA to reconcile your net income. Just fun. Welcome to the show, Suzanne Eichel of Eichel Financial Solutions. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you so much for having me. Well, Suzanne, I've had the pleasure of knowing you for several years now, and I have to say, I've not known many people that work as hard as you do at your craft, and you work hard also at helping other people. You, you're a very giving person, and when I think of accountants, I think of somebody walking around with a green visor with a pencil uh, <laughs> behind their ear and um, kind of mumbling to themselves most of the time, well, that's not you. Where did you get your drive and desire to help people at the same time? Mm, I think I've always been that way. I think it's just the way God ba- made me. So um, I know I just found accounting at an early age, stumbled across tax when I was about 16, and I've been doing it ever since and love it. You know, some people read yeah. about taxes and they take they they do it to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, back when I was doing it, we didn't have computers, so you had to really understand and dive into it and get to know it. And I I found my jam at a young age. What twenty five years you've been doing it? It's it's unbelievable. You're still a very young age, and I got to yeah. watch myself. She's married to a friend of mine, so I got to be careful <laughs> about that. Uh, just fun and on that one too. Earlier in your career, mm-hmm. you worked with Price Waterhouse Coopers and all. Also, the Carlisle Group. You worked with several startup companies. Mm-hmm. You have a, what a heck of a resume, young lady. Oh, thank you. Yeah, what type of service work do you enjoy the absolute most? Mm, that's a trick question. It depends upon what chapter of my life you're talking about. So, my younger days, when I worked for PwC as well as Carlisle Group, I was doing like um, due diligence and turnarounds. Love that. That's my biggest joy I've ever done in my career. Uh, But after having kids, it's really hard to do that kind of work um, on that level. So I started my own practice. And, uh, but I love working with my clients now and seeing them, you know, helping them save money and figure out how to really keep their um, business at a, you know, high level. So it's been great. You know, I had, um a friend of ours, uh, you may know him, Marty Sherman, Sherman Arabians. I had him on here, and I said, you know, what's the secret of your success? And he said, hmm, I just love people. And yeah. I said, well, you know, I've, I've said this on the air once before, and I said, well, Marty, what's the, what, I mean, give me an example of what you do because you love people. And he says, oh, I see somebody walking down the street in the morning, and I say, oh, hi, how are you? And I says, what if you see someone you don't like? And he says, I don't walk down that street. And you're the same way. <laughs> yeah. You love, love people and yeah. it, it just comes through loud and clear very unusual for a CPA to be like that very unusual for someone to have your level of background in in mergers and acquisitions and turnarounds what that's an exciting area right there and if you can get all of the feral cats that circle around that piece of, of meat mm-hmm. to go in the right direction it could just be an amazing accomplishment yeah. self accomplishment as well as accomplishment for any shareholders that it may be Well, thank you. So I found you to be incredibly diligent in your work. How do you ever just keep all those tax laws in your heads, the dates straight in your memory for all of your clients? How do you do that? Uh, You know what? It's a good question. Um, You just, I just do. I, you know, I, I read every morning the new tax codes that come out and tax laws and uh, notices. I do a lot of reading every morning and just I try to stay up on top of it. But also, to me, tax is like a chessboard. It's like when you're looking at someone's account, no two accounts are the same. And you're looking at all the different pieces and trying to figure out what's the best strategy to maximize their, ta- you know, to, to reduce their taxes, right? And to maximize their um, deductions. And I love doing that. It's fun. But also, too, working with the client. And they're not a number, they're a person. And I just, I enjoy getting to know them and getting into the weeds and helping them along the way. Well, you certainly do a great job of it. Well, thank you. Now, Dale, tell me, how do you actually um, 
for a small business, how do you go about um, assessing where they are, what they do, and what you can do for them as their CPA? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I have an intro meeting with them and really getting to know who they are. And like I was saying earlier, there's no two companies the same. They could be having the same type of product or same kind of business, but they're going to run their business completely different. So understanding how they run their business and really diving into it with them and helping them giving them like best practices or figuring out the best strategy, not just for tax, but for running their business. Because I can't tell you how many companies I have helped out, not on the tax side, just helping them because of my background of the work I used to do is bringing that knowledge forth to help them like, what's your five-year plan? Are you planning on selling your business? Let's make sure we tee it up for that. I can't tell you how many companies are like, you know, they're winding down. They didn't realize they could even sell their practice or sell their company. You know, and now it sets them up for a good retirement plan. Um, But getting them and helping them and just spending that time, I think that's the lost trade in my industry. That's one of the things I've been lost is the communication and working with the clients and really understanding where they're at and not just keeping them as a number and, you know, processing it through as quick as possible. And you have some really high level clients, very, very wealthy clients. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you have some ones that are not so wealthy. Mm -hmm. So how do you address the difference between the wealthy client and the ones that are not so wealthy? How do you, how do you do that? Is there any difference? Uh, Well, for me, I have a philosophy in life. We all put our pants on the same way. So therefore, I don't care if it's a $50 million company or a $5,000 profitable company. I'm going to give them their attention that they need and deserve. Mm. But obviously, the company that's doing $50 million is going to have a lot more needs and, and there's a lot more chess pieces to work with. So there's going to be a lot more time. But um, but still, I the one that's starting up, I still give them the same. I still give them the time that they need to help them because someday that five thousand dollar company it could turn into a fifty million dollar company, and I want to be part of that team along the way. Boundless energy. Yeah. You have boundless en- <laughs> energy. The best chief pilot that I ever worked with, and I was in flight standards, but the best chief pilot, um, I heard him say one time to um, an assistant chief pilot, he says, whether or not. It's someone's parent that has died or whether or not it's someone that wants to get off to go skiing, you have to attend the same way to that pilot yep. and deal with it in the same way. You do the same thing. You're yeah. you're absolutely yeah. of that that same nature. Yeah. Talk about vehicle deductions. I always get so confused with those things. How does that actually work? Okay, vehicle deductions. There's um for starters, you gotta have a business, whether it be since this is real estate if you have rentals if you're rentals or you have your own business then you have a card that is dedicated for that doesn't have to be a hundred percent it could be a percentage Um, let's say you only have one vehicle obviously it's not going to be a hundred percent for your rentals or your business because you only have one and everybody has some kind of personal life so you just have to um, you figure out based on miles what the percentage is and then you can deduct accordingly and it also determines too if you're leasing it or if you're buying it and on to depreciation, if you are buying it, there's all these different rules for depreciation. Mm. But mm. but the biggest key is is what is the percentage and what you're using that vehicle for. Ah, gotcha. And I know some families have been hit hard by medical expenses. You wanna say a few words about uh, how one can deduct those medical costs now and what about the dental also? Okay, so dental, medical, um, and then also too that the definition has expanded. It includes you know like massages and if you're doing um, acupunctures, it, there's like a whole wellness side to it as well. Really? And there's a whole list of different type of expenses that are are. I mean, it's a, a very vast list, including if you're going through and trying to get pregnant, so you're doing that whole process, or after you have a baby, you have all these other types of expenses. All of that can be included. Is this new? Um, it got issued um, during the CARES Act, so uh-huh. it got expanded. And so, but with that, how you deduct it is, depends upon: are do you have your own business or are you W two? Uh-huh. And if you're W two, then you itemize on Schedule A, and it's reduced by seven point five percent of your AGI. So chances are, if you live around here in this Bay area you can't really there's not much to deduct because your agi is too high but if you have your own business that's a different story you can work out a program through your company to do a reimbursement program 
Ah, very interesting. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. There's something new that's called cost segregation. I have no clue what that is. Would you oh, yes. help us with that? So cost segregation has been around for quite some time, but it came very popular in the last few years under this CARES Act um, when they elected the, it's called a special depreciation, which means that if you have depreciation in the three, five, and seven, and 15-year bucket, you can elect to depreciate all of that year one. So what cost segregation means for in real estate is that if you have a rental property or a commercial property, you can have a um, you can hire a company that does cost segregations, nicknamed cost seg, and they come in and they take the value of the property that you purchased and then they break it out between land and building, and building's depreciable. So if it's residential, it's 27.5 years. But instead of saying it's all 27.5 years, they break that property down into the three, five, five, and seven and 15 year buckets, and then some will go in 27.5. So as I was just saying, the three through 15, you can deduct all that year one. So basically you're front loading a big percentage of that depreciation in year one. Wow. So if you're a real estate professional and you've got rentals and you do a cost say, you can create a huge net operating loss for yourself the first year. The only caveat is if you're not a real estate professional, a cost seg doesn't do you any good because you can only depre- you can only claim the loss either zero or maybe a small portion of the loss depending upon what your AGI is. Ah, real estate professional. There's an actual definition for that. Yes, there is, and it's not just being a realtor. No, in fact, you don't even have to be a realtor. Right. It's just it, the rule is is if you're in the real estate, if you're doing something interacting with real estate, like a contractor or in the trades, mortgage broker, so forth, you're in real estate, then you qualify. Or if you have 750 hours that you're working in the, so in other words, if you have five rentals and you're self-managing, you more than likely are spending at least 750 hours managing it, meaning the accounting, running supplies, collecting rents, t- taking care of your taxes, all that stuff. You track your hours, 750 or more, you qualify as a real estate professional. Now you can claim all that depreciation on a cost seg. Amazing. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Welcome to the Real Estate Minute with REMAX expert, Michael Hatfield. What does an agent do to get a home sold? Typically, an agent will prepare a comparative market analysis so he knows the home's value, then creates a marketing plan tailored just for your home. With these plans, he promotes the home globally and locally in social media, publications, open houses, all for the purpose of getting your home front and center with prospective buyers. As an agent, how do you get it sold, Michael? We do each and every item in the plan, negotiate vigorously on the client's behalf on inspection repairs, staging, and importantly, the deal itself. We do everything we can to get the deal done and closed. Call 925-322-7775 now to schedule an appointment or complimentary home analysis. For excellence in real estate, call the Michael Hatfield Remax team at 925-322-7775 or go to michaelhatfieldhomes.com. Now, back to our show. We're talking with Suzanne Eichel. She is um, CPA extraordinaire. Uh, her offices are in San Ramon, California. It's Eichel Financial Solutions. Suzanne Eichel, just an amazing CPA. She does not, at least I've never seen her wear that green visor with a pencil behind her head. (laughs) Um, A lot of energy, a lot of talent, a very, very positive person, which leads me to my next question. Suzanne, you you give a lot. I mean, you're a... um, you like charities, I think, mm-hmm. and you like to give to people that are not so, not so, not doing so well. And lately, my heartbeat has been into that. You, you may have known I've, you know, I've supported mm-hmm. City Team Ministries mm-hmm. as well as uh, another lady that has had some problems and tried to help them wherever I can. You're the same. Mm-hmm. You're the same heartbeat. Mm-hmm. You, you walk to that same heartbeat. I believe your husband does too. Yeah. Would you like to expand on that a little bit? What, what you like to do? Um. Well, especially during the pandemic, it wasn't just the Bay Area. It was across the country. But especially in California, we were on a lockdown for over two years, and during that lockdown, a lot of businesses could not be in business they had they had yeah they had to have their door shut so what do you do if you're self-employed what do you do you have employees you got to feed your family your doors are shut 
what do you do and where do you turn? And so I really spent, I mean, I was working around the clock and not even working with clients, even just, just helping out in the community with businesses, helping them figure out what to do. It mostly was, first of all, in their heart, what can you do? Change that mindset because they were spiraling in depression because yes. they were scared. So how do you turn it around to find the light so that way now you can turn something that's going to be a bad situation into a positive situation and let's figure out a way to you know survive. And so I did, that was my charity work that I did in the last, actually the last four years was really working with companies and how to turn this situation around. Because even when the mandate was over and they were able to open back up, business has changed, everything's changed. So how do you survive the new norm? So I've really dedicated a lot of time helping people with that. Not only, like I said, not just clients, but just people who need the help. Wow, yeah. everyone can actually determine how dedicated and tenacious you are. There's something about the way that you walk, your husband, the way he walks. You've got something in your heart. You're out of that darkness, you're into the light, and you're on the positive side of things. And I have to I have to applaud that Thank from you. a personal standpoint. Well, I do have to say, though, that every company I worked with, not one person had to close their doors. Like, not one person had to just shut it down. They Everybody survived. So did they call you Banker Suzanne? Is that what it was at the time? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Now there's another one that's out there on the internet now and a lot of buzz about it. It's called the Airbnb tax code. What's yeah. that all about? Okay, that is that one is so on the Okay, on the IRS code, um, on the internet, apparently there's a lot of articles and there's been some podcasts out there that's talking about this Airbnb IRS code. There is no actual IRS code called the Airbnb, but what it is 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 they're talking about rentals that are 14 days or less. So people who have homes that they're using for Airbnb, because most people who rent a home is less than 14 days, they think that they qualify to claim it as a short-term rental, and that's what it's all about. The problem is, is if you, it's designed for if you have your personal home and you rent it out for 14 days or less, then it's a short-term rental and you can follow those rules. But if you have a second property or more and those properties are designated as a rental property and you do Airbnb all year round, it might not be rented out all year round, but it's available. The purpose of the property is that then that's a real estate property. That's a business property. That's Schedule E. That's a long-term rental. Like that, there is no short-term on that. But that's where the that's where the disconnect is because I'm getting a lot of people asking me about that. I'm hearing about this all the time. Well, it's an Airbnb. It's short-term. But yes, what's the purpose of the property? And why that's important is if it's a personal property, then you can claim when you decide to sell it the 250 or $500,000 exclusion. But also too, it's a personal property. You sell it, have capital gains, it's capital gains. Right. Versus if it's a business property, there is no exclusion. Right. And- There's no credit either. <laughs> and, it, and and if it's a gain, it's, bus, it's ordinary income. So it's a huge delta there. So, so this whole misconception about short-term versus long-term, that's one that people need to really realize like, okay, it doesn't matter how long someone's in the house, it's what the purpose of that property is. Wow, how do you just summarize it right up there, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Give us some tips on how a, how you can work better, uh, you know, a person can work better with their CPA. The good word is is avoid legitimately per the tax laws. How can a person work better with a CPA to reduce those taxes? That's a really good question. Um, best ways to re is, is to maximize your deductions is get organized, keep track of your expenses. Like I'll, I'll give you a quick tip. When you go to the grocery, if you have your own rental property, you're self-managing, or you have your own business, when you go to the grocery store, pick up some clean supplies, or Kleenex, or coffee or creamer if you have your own home office, and and a part of your groceries, highlight those, throw them in a file, end of the year, tally it all up. You just picked up a whole bunch of more deductions. You just qualified your car for more write-offs, right? Because now your car is used for business as opposed to a personal um, errand. Uh -huh. But on top of it, it's it's keeping track of the expenses and giving them to your accountant. That way now you have, you're organized and you're giving things to your client. You're not just giving your CPA all these receipts. You've got everything tallied up and ready to go. And that's the best way to work with the CPA because when you throw a whole bunch of stuff at them, 
they most of them are not going to spend the time to go through it and really figure out what you're giving them. So the end result is garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. And that's not what you want right. when you deal with a professional at, at right. your caliber and your level. But just one more thing I want to add to that too is, is when a CPA is very common to give their clients what's called a tax organizer and they're asking you to fill it all out. Question that. And the reason being is most CPAs are taking those tax organizers and giving them to a staffer to data entry in. There could be a huge disconnect there. So if you have your own business or you have rental properties, make sure you give that information outside of the organizers. That way they understand what that information is for. And that way there's no disconnect between what is going to go in your return versus what is you know, what you have. Ah, ah. Always hearing that don't deduct your home office if you have a business because it triggers an audit. Is this true? What? How does that all work, that home office thing? Okay, and so in 2018, the the home office got expanded. And basically, the, the law is saying now, it, the definition, and what it is is the law hasn't changed. It's the tax courts that redefine the home office deduction. And so if you have a place in your home that the primary purpose is to do your work, whether full-time your work or even answering phone calls and doing emails, but it's an area that's designated, it's not your kitchen table, it's an area or a room, then that qualifies for home office if you have your own business or you're managing your own rental properties. And when I say that, it's because some people who have W-2 income, they're not aware that they could actually claim their home office for managing their rental properties. That's interesting. Now, one, I, I got a couple real estate questions. One is, what is a stepped up basis on a home and when is that usually applied? Okay, stepped up basis, um, great question. I get, um, this is one that a lot of people do not understand. Step up means that when you are, when someone passes and the property is then transferred to the beneficiary, it is stepped up in basis. Um, and that step up in basis, it either time of death or six months thereafter, it, but it's stepped up. And, um, and so that's one that you really want to work with your CPA. And then also too, you work with um, whoever is on the handling, like the trust or so forth the to trustee. make sure, right to make sure that um, it's um, that the, the the values are being qualified. Ah, so gotcha, and also having a great realtor to sell the home within that six months is also Absol very helpful because it establishes the value of the stepped up basis. Absolutely. So regarding the administration of a trust after the primary trustee or the settler has passed, mm -hmm. settler, sorry, got to say it right. <laughs> what tax returns? Um, is the successor trustee required to file? So it depends on how much the estate is. So if the state is right now over 12, it's, it's, it's estate tax credit's a little over 12 million. So if the state is over that, then they have to file an estate tax return because there will be taxes owed. I always suggest to file one anyway because that way when the assets, it lets the IRS knows where the assets are being transferred, whether it's being transferred to a, a trust or if it's being transferred to a beneficiaries, individuals, or a combination. Um, if there is a trust set up, then a trust return needs to be completed uh, and filed for every year that the EIN is open. That's a big, huge misconception too, because people think that if there's no activity, a trust return does not need to be filed, but that's not true. Hmm. And then of course, you need to also prepare that the person who deceased their final 1040 and state return and marked final. Um, because that's how you close out Social Security. Good to know, good to know. Yeah. Question, after a person has owned a home for a long period of time, how? what are the steps in establishing the value, thus the gain or on the home in California, it's normally a gain, um, on the gain on the home? And then how does that work? Married credit, single credit? Okay. How does um, that go? Great question. So um, the basics, and there's a, a little caveats behind this. That's why it's always advisable to talk to a tax professional. But it's basically you take the sale price minus the closing fees and closing expenses or selling like selling expenses. Like, did you do re landscaping or fix up the kitchen or whatever those expenses are? Mm -hmm. um, made are your improvements for that property um, and the purchase price, and then that gives you your gain or loss and if you still have a gain depending upon if you've owned the house for five years and you've lived in it for two of those five years as your primary residence 
then you can claim the two hundred fifty or five hundred thousand dollar exclusion. However, there's a caveat to this, and that is if that property was your personal and then you transfer it to business and you had it as a rental, it's now a rental. So you have to re-establish it as a personal residence in order to get those ex- um, personal exemptions. Good to know. That's really great to know. I'm going to jump back for just a moment, and I'd like to talk about those food and beverage deductions. Ta- tell me about what's going on with those. Okay, so starting last year, um, the for meals and en- entertainment, the laws uh, got expanded and changed. So for meals, um, if you go to a restaurant, um, it's 100% deductible. But if you buy food um, to do a dinner party, that would still be 50% deductible. However, as a realtor, when you do open houses and you go to the grocery store and you buy some food and drinks to have for your open house, that would be 100% deductible for you because it's it's a part of your supplies. Wow, that's just fabulous. Talking about small businesses, I heard one piece of advice one one time, the biggest mistake a small business can make is to think like a small business. Mm-hmm. And having a person that is your CPA work your business, which is maybe a small business, like you would a large business, is going to be a huge, huge benefit. You know, I wanted to say thank you so much for having me. This has been great, and I just, I really admire what you're doing. Miss Suzanne Eichel, CPA extraordinaire, Eichel Financial Solutions in San Ramon. So much. You've been listening to Real Estate and More Show. Interesting people like this amazing CPA, topics of the day like tax and accounting at year end, and of course, real estate. You can listen to archived real estate and more shows at michaelhatfieldhomes.com radio. The real estate and more show is now available on demand on Spotify, Amazon, iTunes, iHeart, and other podcast directories as well. Tune in next week and until then, have a blessed week. The views and opinions expressed are based on current economic and market conditions and are subject to change. Information on the show provided for illustrator purposes only and does not constitute professional or legal advice. Information from sources deemed reliable, but accuracy and completeness not guaranteed. Michael Hatfield and the Michael Hatfield Remax team have no liability for information discussed on the show. Consult with qualified professionals prior to taking action. We at the Michael Hatfield Remax team enjoy representing our valued clients. If you or someone you know is interested in buying or selling and wishes to schedule a complimentary appointment with the Michael Hatfield Remax team, call us at 925-322-7775. That's 925-322-7775. Or go to our website, michaelhatfieldhomes.com. I'm Michael Hatfield. Thank you for listening today. Join us next Saturday for the next Real Estate and More when we again sharpen our focus on how's the market. Join us next Saturday and have a wonderful week. Best wishes and blessings to you. DRE 01493761.